great. And we'll go ahead and start. Thank you for coming to Teddy Talks Traverso. Um, this is an online series about um, anything that has to do with historical flute playing. And um, my name is Teddy. I am a historical flutist based in Mainz, Germany. Thank you for joining us today. And um, I love bringing in people together. And so today I really have the great honor to be interviewing a former uh, mentor, um, important mentor of mine, Dr. David Lasowski. Um, I do call him David since um, I think we've known each other for like over 20 years now, <laughs> David. So I do call him David and I'm sure that all, um, he wouldn't mind. He would have no ob objections well, for you all to do so as well. So, and just a quick introduction um, for those of you who might find his name perhaps vaguely familiar. Um, David was the head of the Music Reference Services at the Music Library of Indiana University, uh, Bloomington, and that's where we met. I did my um, um, undergrad there. Um, and actually, uh, in addition to my undergraduate degree, I ended up also doing a, a one semester of independent study with David. And um, David is an internationally renowned scholar on the subject of historical woodwinds. Um, he has retired from Indiana University back in 2011 and currently finds himself in Brazil. How amazing. You're in Sao Paulo, is that right? Correct. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through his numerous publications, whether books, articles, editions of music, David is a, a prize winner of numerous prizes and has also received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Recorder Society. And in case you're wondering, which I think is also a nice point that David has pointed out on his website, his name is pronounced Lasotsky. So the C has a T-S sound at the end. That's right. Okay. So with that, welcome, David, and thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Well, it's great to see you again, Teddy. Actually, we've known each other about 30 years, almost 30 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, yes, time flies when, we, when you're having fun, huh? Yes, yes, definitely. And um, through, you know, both of us have moved around quite a bit in, all, in between those years, but we still manage to keep in touch. And that's always, I find that such an amazing thing. <laughs> um, now, besides early music, many of you may not know that David has actually written five books about a uh, New Orleans jazz group, Astral Project. Um, and he is also a healer and a certified practitioner of a, a couple of um, healing methods. So we have lots to talk about today. Um, before I start asking David questions though, um, I like to ask you, my fellow audience, a question and people can key in their answers um, as we go along. Some of you may know this uh, already. Um, I'll start, just do a quick screen share here. Um, so you can either take your smartphone, I don't already see that. You can take your smartphone and um, uh, scan the QR code or go to menti.com um, and type in the code there. So here's a question that, you know, maybe you want to think about as we go along on talking to David. What's your take on the relationship between studying how music was performed in the past and actual performance practice in our world today? Yeah, so as performers of early music, we're always kind of juggling this question with, of, um, okay, here's all this information. What do we do with this information? Okay, so you can think about that and key in as many um, answers as you like um, as we go along. And for now, we'll travel with David through our virtual time machine. Can I close this? Has people gotten the um, thing? Or maybe I'll, I'll keep it on a little bit in case um, people lose a, a track here. Um, okay, great. So David, let's start from the very beginning. Um, how did your connection with music start and um, why the recorder? My connection with music, it's, it's really interesting because I came from an unmusical family. In fact, my mother was tone deaf, um, but 
she very kindly supported my own interest in music right from the beginning. Uh, I played the piano a little bit as a child and then uh, the re violin a little bit in school once upon a time. They didn't take very well, speaking of take, but uh, one thing that I did, uh, one thing was very important in my life was that I sang in a church choir between the ages of 10 and 15. And um, when we talked before, I didn't even think to mention that, but that was very formative singing in the church choir. Uh, my voice started to break when I was about 12, but it never really broke properly. And it became uh, a subject of great embarrassment to me that my voice wasn't breaking. Perhaps there was some hormonal deficiency that nowadays could have been remedied very easily. <laughs> so I, I kept on singing boys parts, what, what were called treble in England, um, until I was 15. And, and then it was really way beyond embarrassing that at 15, I was still singing these parts. So I forced myself to start singing a kind of croaky tenor instead of treble, which did my voice no good. And I've had trouble with my voice the whole time ever since. For, my, for the rest of my life, I've had trouble with my voice and don't sing very well because, because of what I tried to do at that age. And looking back on it, I think, well, if I had been born more recently, I could have been another Bruno de Sa and become a male sopranist instead, you see, and become famous and be traveling the opera houses of the world or whatever. Right. But no, yeah. but no, instead, I As just embarrassed happen, myself yes. <laughs> and, and ruined my voice. So that was the beginning of that. That was the beginning of music. How did I get involved with the flute and the recorder? When I was about 14, we went to visit some friends of the family and the man of the house played the flute. And very reluctantly, after we said, come on, play it for us. He swear, said, come on, play it for, you know, this is the usual thing. He, he played the flute a bit. And then I found myself saying to him, I don't know how that happened. It came out of nowhere. I said, I would like to learn to play a woodwind instrument. And, and I, I don't know how I actually knew what a woodwind instrument was because I had very little musical background. Anyway, I told him I wanted to play a woodwind instrument and he said to me, which one? Good question. And I said, oh, I don't know. And he said, well, if you don't know, I suggest you start playing the recorder because that will give you some basic technique and so on. And then when you've got that, then you can choose a real musical instrument instead. So right. you the classic line about recorder. Exactly. So, <clears throat> so I did, I started on the recorder. I, I taught myself to play soprano recorder, but then I always wanted to play a real woodwind instrument as well. So after a couple of years, um, I bought a very cheap modern flute um, and started teaching myself to play that either. It's not a good idea to teach yourself to play either the recorder or the flute. But um, I became very interested in Baroque music through the flute, primarily. Oh, that's, that's and, I, and I remember I even surprising. read Quant. The Quant's translation came out when, how old was I? I was, I was 19, but somehow, but I remember reading bits of Quant's in Arnold Dolmetsch or something. Anyway, oh, that's right. I listened to a recording of the Quant's trio sonata for flute and recorder and continuum. Right. Mm. In which they play all the slow movements with note in egal, right? And so uh, when I got a flute teacher who was an orchestral flute player, um, I wanted to play this piece for her. And I played it with note in egal. And she said, she said, no, no, stop this. What are you doing? And I said, well, you know, this is how they did it in the old days. And she said, never mind how they did it in the old days. I want you to play this this music straight, I want you to play the rhythm straight. And I said, I just can't do that. I've heard Very it this way, I, I, I can't undo this, I can't play. Anyway, and so the result was she actually got rid of me, she fired me, she refused to teach me anymore because I, I, I didn't want to play, play this piece in the modern style. Wow, may I ask how old were you back then, around this time? Uh... So that was um, 16 to 17, yeah. Okay. So that was my experience. And then, but then I read more about performance practice and listened to a lot of recordings 
of uh, what we then call authentic performance and now what we call historically informed performance. And then on a, on a trip to London, we went to Musica Rara, which is better known as a publisher or became known as a publisher later, but it, it was a shop in London that sold instruments and they had some 18th century flutes in stock. And so I found one that I couldn't afford, which was a six keyed potter. Mm -hmm. made probably around 1780 and it had it had um, a metal metal lined head joint <laughs> and, it, and it had six keys but anyway you could play you could ignore the keys and play it like a, a one keyed flute ignore five of the keys and so I bought it and it cost me six guineas six pounds six shillings I remember at that time which is which is you can't even get lunch for that price nowadays but in those days Right. It was a fair amount of money, so I borrowed this money, borrowed this money from my mother, and bought this flute and went home and started teaching myself how to play six keyed and one keyed flute instead of the modern flute. Wow, that's amazing! So that was my beginning. This is before I, you know, I only had a few lessons with this orchestral flute player. But then, when I was eighteen, just after I finished high school, I discovered that the firm of Merck, Hem and Merck Verlag in Zella was having a summer workshop at which, among other things, they were teaching Traverso. And so I quickly, a very short notice, I flew over there to Zella and took part in this, this workshop where there were a number of other players of the flute and uh, of Traverso and recorder, and it was wonderful. And it was actually uh, a gr the greatest significance in my life because that's where I met Betty Bang Mather. I know you'd like me to say more about her later. But anyway, I met her when I was 18, the summer workshop in Germany, and she played the Traverso so wonderfully. I thought, absolutely, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to be a Traverso player. So that, that's how all, all that started. Wow. So it seems like, at, you know, starting from an early age that you already had contact with, you know, historical performance and historical... Um, yeah instruments i mean instruments you know, yes yeah yeah i mean for most of us you know generally people nowadays i mean except unless you're a reporter player you know i came from the modern flute um and because obviously you know i had no access to uh european early music um growing up in taiwan and so uh the traversal came uh, much later during my time at indiana and you know, many, I think most of us tend to follow that kind of first a modern instrument and then people start to get into the historical counterpart. But it seems like you kind of jumped pretty much, you know, directly into the historical. They jumped directly into it, path. right. And then, and then when I did study the modern flute, eventually I went to the United States to study flute with Betty Bang Mather. And I actually didn't like playing the modern flute. And it really put me off flute playing altogether, unfortunately, <laughs> because I had thought naively that I wasn't playing traverso very well because I just couldn't play the flute very well. And if I learned the modern flute, I would become a better traverso player. But in fact, that didn't work very well. There wasn't much crossover and it put me off flute playing altogether. And after that, I pretty much concentrated on the recorder. Uh -huh. Okay, so you were there, you came to the States to um study and were you coming as a music like a performance major or i'm just wondering how did musicology how did you end up going into musicology then huh. well it's another unusual story actually in i i started as an undergraduate at the university of london in 1965 and i was studying chemistry i'd got really stuck in science subjects in high school in england and um my interest in science was waning at the same time as my interest in music was was waxing and increasing but i had no way to to change because i had no prerequisites to study music so i actually finished studying chemistry but the year that i finished graduated in chemistry i published a performance practice book which was my translation of jacques otter le roman principe de la flûte you told me you didn't know my translation, you only know the rival translation that was published by Dover that year. Um, but I published it so that year when I actually turned 21. I published this translation of Otter 
And on the strength of it, I got accepted at the University of Iowa as a graduate study student to study music. So I even started music very late. Not a good way to do it either, you know, but that was the way it went. And um, at the University of Iowa, the chair of the department, whatever he was called, I don't remember his correct title, was Jaime Voxman, who was very famous in the United States as a, as a woodwind educator. He was a clarinetist, but he played all the woodwinds of it, and he'd published lots of instruction books, and he was very well known. And when he saw this translation I had done, he was very impressed, especially because I had no music background. And so I went to the University of Iowa, and they gave me a, a research assistantship. They gave me money to go, and that's how it all started. And it wasn't clear what my status was, because I wasn't really a performer. What was I? And eventually it became clear that my interest was more in research than in performance. And so then I got a master's degree in, I think they call it something like musicology and woodwind literature. Although I didn't study woodwind, any woodwind literature either. <laughs> uh -huh. but, but that's how it worked. And so it was clear that my interest was more in research. And then so it has been from that time on. Mm -hmm. And that's... um. Um, obviously, that's where where you had more extensive contact with um, Betty Bang Mather, which we'll get to just a bit. And um, yes. I also want to ask, can you name some um, other early mentors who were important for you in, you know, helping to shape your shape your, your path in those early years? Well, while I was a chemistry student in London, I, I took lessons with Edgar Hunt, who was very well known in the recorder world. He was a big pioneer of the recorder in England. And I, I, but I, I took traversal lessons with him for a year because I really wanted to focus on the, on the, uh, on the traverso rather than the recorder. At the end of that first year, I went to Germany for a week or so and I studied with Gustav Scheck. And Scheck said to me, you're studying the Traverso with Edgar Hunt? Hmm. Maybe you should um, study the recorder with him instead. <laughs> he was not very <laughs> impressed with how much progress I had made on Traverso. And so then when I went back to London for a couple of years, then I studied recorder with Hunt. And Hunt didn't take me very seriously as a student because I wasn't one of his regular students. I was just taking private lessons. But he um arranged some contacts for me he put me in contact with other people in the early music field who proved very helpful it was walter bergman mm -hmm. who was uh, the senior editor at shots and um, i ended up doing some editions with him actually and he was always very kind to me took me out to lunch a lot thinking that i must be starving which i probably was he was very kind and then he introduced me when he felt that the Otter translation was not suitable for shots. He introduced me to John Thompson, better known as J.M. Thompson, who founded the Early Music magazine. And John was working as a editor for a publisher that published the translation. And so Walter Bergman and John Thompson were very important mentors to me in London. And then um, before I left London, I also met Franz Brüchen, because Walter Bergman, one of the great things he did for early music was he used his own money to bring stars of early music from Europe over to London and play a concert with him at the Wigmore Hall. And so he brought Franz Bruggen twice that I heard, maybe more than that. And um, he introduced me to Franz and I showed Franz and the edition of uh, Vivaldi, the great Vivaldi C minor recorder concerto that I was preparing for Musica Rara. I forgot to mention Musica Rara, but I'll get to them in a minute. And Franz seemed to be impressed. And then I, I made a good co connection with Franz. It became very important over the next 10 years. So he hired me to write some program notes for recordings of his. And then eventually he commissioned me to do the subject that became my doctoral dissertation. And that was a study of professional recorder players who worked in England in the Renaissance and Baroque periods. He got some money from some German film company to make a documentary about recorder players of the past. 
And he said to me, look, we know about composers, we know about publishers and instrument makers and so on, but we know next to nothing about performers of the past. So I'm commissioning people in several European countries to research recorded players of the past in their countries. And can you do England? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> And I did, but and I, it turned out I was the only one who ever finished the research. <laughs> and so the, the, the documentary never got made, but I got started with the subject, which eventually I turned into a doctoral dissertation. And for me, it was the beginning of a performer-centered approach to music history. Mm -hmm. So if you read most history books, they're, they're focused on composers um, and of course music, um, occasionally you find people concentrating on instrument makers, but performance only turn, the performers only turn up much later, like great pianists of the past kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, early performers have been very much neglected. Nevertheless, if, if you start looking at music history through the focus of performers, that opens up into a different perspective on the whole of music history. Because you start asking, well, where do they, where do they train and how? Where do they get their instruments from? Where do they get their music from? Did they also compose? If not, where do, who performed for them? Where did they play? All those kinds of questions. And so the music history opens up from the focus on performers rather than starting with the performers and music and maybe the performers are in the background. And that's, that was, that's been key to my research on music ever since. You start with the performers no matter what subject you're working on and go, okay, well, who is playing this and what can we learn from them? That's a really interesting perspective. And I never thought about, you know, of course mm. we can take different, yeah, different perspectives in the research. And do you think that comes from the fact that you started, you know, you started wanting to play, you, you know, at least you, wanting to, you started as a performer, so to speak, and that, well, it said, you know, as, as, a, as, a, yeah. as a former would-be performer, I would say it, it appealed to me for sure. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And, uh, and performance practice questions come out of the same thing, really. They start with performers. They're the people who are practicing. So <laughs> you start with the performers. Yeah. Wow, that's just amazing to hear that. Um, it seems like things took off for you relatively early and also relatively um, fast and you know all those ma names that you've mentioned they were they were the you know the important people uh, in the generation who still continue to have influence in um, they're still influential gener right generations um, that's just really amazing to hear that um, yeah that your connection with them um, Tell us a bit about Betty uh, Bang Mather, and this name might not be familiar to uh, many people who, especially who are outside of the um, US uh, American early music scene. Um, obviously she was your teacher and um, you've also collaborated with her on a number of books. So how did that collaboration start? And yeah, just. Well, as I already mentioned, I met her when I was 18 in the summer in Germany of this, of this course. And then we started um, corresponding. And she was working on a kind of performance practice book for the flute. And it wasn't going very well and she needed some help. And so I became an informal research assistant to her actually. And eventually, in order to get the book in good enough shape to be even looked at by a publisher, um, I retyped the whole book for her and, and retyped the musical examples I remember, and she paid me for doing this job. You know, So I, I was definitely even a paid informal assistant to her in the beginning. And then when I wanted to get out of chemistry and into music, as I said, she, she arranged for me to, to go to the University of Iowa. I started taking lessons with her and then we continued the collaboration, but then more as equals. One of the first things we did was we took what became my master's thesis. My master's thesis was on the 18th century woodwind cadenza. So we took that and we made it into a workbook. So I, su I supplied the, the content and she supplied the idea of how to teach it. So that was one of the ones we did. Mm -hmm. And then we also did books about preluding and uh, free ornamentation together. It took about 10 years altogether. 
Yes. Was... But we tried to cover um, certain aspects, maybe, maybe some of the most important aspects of of woodwind performance practice. What I never did, what I was originally going to do as a doctoral dissertation was to look at uh, woodwind articulation in the classical period, so articulation. And I actually started doing that as a doctoral dissertation, but it didn't work out very well because I could never make a connection between artic articulation patterns and the phrase and period structure of classical music. And I think that actually there, were, there was no <laughs> um, relationship between the two, that the tonguing patterns were fairly arbitrary. And I didn't want to spend a whole dissertation saying that. I, I had hoped to find more. So I just abandoned the subject. <laughs> <laughs> so it is something maybe to get back to sometime. Right. I don't know. I, but eventually I did a completely different subject as a dissertation. But anyway, so we tried to cover woodwind performance practice together. And she wrote a book herself on... Uh, French performance practice, for which I was an assistant. I didn't get my name on it, but uh, uh, we also worked together on that one. And um, she is still currently in Iowa? Is that, is that where she's she's still living in Iowa City. City. She's yes. um, about to turn 97. She's still playing the flute, as far as I know. That's amazing. Uh, both her parents lived to be 100. And her father was still playing the flute in public at 100, so she still has a few years to go wow. to beat him. <laughs> but um, she's a very, um, she, she has enormous curiosity and, and drive and focus and very, very interested in everything. She was, she was a great inspiration to me as a researcher. You know, it's like we have to pursue this, you know, what's the best way of doing this? Even in writing, you know, what's the best way to write it? I remember that we deliberately wrote these books on performance practice in very simple English because she tried them out on her flute students. She tried, a, I, I just wrote something and she tried it out on them and they, they couldn't handle um, compound sentences. I don't mean to say anything bad about um, flute players at, at the University of Iowa, but, but this is a true story. <laughs> They, they couldn't understand sentences with more than one clause. <laughs> so, oh, no. yes, yeah, so we deliberately wrote these books in very simple sentences. Oh. <laughs> when I look back on it now, I look at them and go, oh, I don't know. Because what I tried to do later in life was to write clearly, but, but with, with more than simple sentences. Right. Anyway, but the idea of writing simply and clearly in order so you can reach not writing for musicologists or historians, but writing also primarily for performers that, and writing simply in so they can understand it. Um, that's continued uh, and stood me well for my whole life as well. Many people have been kind to say that they find my books very clear and easy to read. And so I owe it really to that initial training yes. with her. <laughs> Yes, and you know, I think it also speaks to the fact that why these books have been so successful and also unique in their publication. I think they're not, you know, um, many other uh, other publications that are similar to what you have produced with. Uh, right. Betty. Yes. Well, I, yeah. Well, I I reprinted them recently, and they're they're still selling. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we'll get to that in just a bit. We'll get as to well. the, uh, Okay. All right. Yes. Um, Let's um let's hear a little bit of music now. I had asked you if you could um maybe suggest a clip that is of interest to you. Um, I'm not sure. Or maybe I, you want to play the Moreski? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. So 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 um, maybe I can say I know people have been asked this of you, but what I I'd like to say just a few words about this before we play, give us some okay. context. So recently, um, in Brazil, where indeed I'm now living. I went to a lecture about castrati. There's a woman who uh, published a book based on her dissertation about the history of castrati in Brazil, actually. And so she gave a lecture to the general public about castrati. And at the end of it, she played some recordings, but she did not play a recording of a castrata, but we have some recordings by a castrato made around 1900. His name was Alessandro Moreschi. He worked for the Sistine Chapel in Rome. He made a number of recordings that have survived. 
And um, I felt sure she would play this recording or ought to have done. And so after the lecture, I, I said, well, why, why didn't you play this recording? And she said, oh, I don't like it. So <laughs> this brings up the broad that I, I was not very um, pleased with this answer. I felt that it was, uh, she, was, she was being irresponsible as a scholar. No matter what you think of it, this is a document. This is a historical document of, of authentic performance. Not, not just historically informed performance, this is historical performance. And we ought to hear it. And yes. so let's hear it now and we can see what we think about it. Okay. So I hope, so, um, let me, I'll play, let me know if the sound comes through, because I'm not sure if I also did the sound share now, okay? So, I'm so this is the Bach Guno Ave Maria, as it says, and you hear the Bach prelude that starts it. Yes. Was, was there music? Yes. Yeah, okay, 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 great. I'll just go ahead. Okay, it just, it's a couple minutes. So <clears throat> this is a very interesting surviving document. So he does at least a couple of things that we wouldn't do nowadays. He tends to scoop down from his high notes and he, and he switches constantly between head voice and chest voice um, in a fairly obvious way. But I find this extremely powerful recording. <laughs> it's very, very moving. And uh, to, we cannot ignore this kind of document. But I think, uh, well, we don't have time to play other examples. There are plenty of recordings from the early 20th century of pianists playing. And when we listen to those, they, uh, 
They sound very strange to us now, speeding up and slowing down constantly, um, very in inaccuracy of the rhythm, um, spreading chords instead of just playing chords and so on. And um, these are historical documents that we choose not to copy. And you know why? Because we hate them. We hate these authentic examples of historical performance. You think I guarantee yeah. if there was a recording of Bach playing today, we would hate it. Do you think it's because we want to we want to we, we want them to fit our story and if they don't fit our um our our imagination our you know maybe it's yeah our imagination of what how they played back then 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 we choose to not uh, yeah to to pay attention absolutely yes and so it it brings up the question that so what are we doing with all this uh, historical performance practice information maybe do you want to come back to that later um, yeah. or you well, want to yeah, talk well, about it now sure let's take a look at what people have written so far yeah okay okay so we've got people you know it gives information about ornamentation applying rhetoric knowledge about style musical discourse um informed guesswork yes uh tells us about articulation how to phrase um relationship mm -hmm. I heard you. That means relationship and playing. Um, I don't know if somebody could elaborate more on that and informed performance. Okay, so what, you know, at least what I gather, it seems like, you know, we can take the information what, that we discover and somehow translate that into our playing today that, you know, hopefully can give a, a give us a a, a, a nearer um, uh, yeah uh, story of a near uh, version of how people might have played back then. And that's the well. Point can I can I yeah? Okay. Can I say a few things about that? So of course, yeah. So so first of all, we we're getting our information from treatises primarily, which were never intended to train professionals. Professionals trained by apprenticeship one-on-one -on -one with masters. And so the books that we're reading today were written for amateurs. If you've ever read any modern books written for amateurs, how well could you learn to play from these books? Hmm. Not so well, probably. <laughs> and so, so we, ha we have rather limited information about the past, actually. And new information does show up and it's, it's usually interesting and helpful. But I just wanted, first of all, to say that we only have a small idea about how music was performed in the past. In the past. Nevertheless, what we do know is very helpful from a practical point of view. And I take performance practice to be practice. We, it gives us answers to practical questions, gives us questions about how do we interpret the notation um what what was the instrumentation that they used what pitch did they use and how that, did that relate to things articulation what articulation did they use um how did the articulations work if if we try to play on instruments that are similar to theirs how did these things work on those instruments and so it gives us uh, a more complete idea of what the music was like because mu music comes from some kind of notation and it has to be um, fashioned into a kind of story, as you said. We have to make a story from it. If we look at what we know about their story in the past and we take it seriously, then we're going to make a different story today. If we look at what they did in the past and we hate it, we're going to make a, a partially different story about that. And there are people still today who, who are still not interested in learning about performance practice in the past. They just want to play. So how do they play? They play how they hear, how their teacher tells them to play, how they hear play, uh, music being played on recordings. And so they are really stuck in, um, 
in a kind of non-historical way of doing it. So I, I personally think that the, the historical information is part of our education. As, as educated musicians, we can play the music of the past in a more satisfying way for ourselves and our audiences. Nevertheless, if you go back, I, I've been listening to recordings of authentic performance, historically informed performance that go back to the 1930s, 40s, I was brought up on ones from the 50s and 60s and so on. It changes over time. If you go back and listen to some of the early recordings of hit performance, you go, well, everything's kind of slow and, uh, and a bit stodgy and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so things, things have changed and they've not changed really because so much because we have more information as because our own taste has changed. Hmm. Nowadays, there's a taste, uh, particularly for recorder players and string players, I don't know about traverso players, to play very fast and very staccato. No. And what they enjoy is the verve of the performance. Um, but they lose all the rest. Well, what about melody, harmony? <laughs> articulation that's not staccato rhetoric and so on they lose all of that they lose so much in the music and i think it's a great shame but but this is part of the authentic taste of today okay i will stop there oh no no that's that's a lot to um yeah to think about i think for for all of us and well my question is since you had mentioned well these treatises they were since they were meant for um amateurs so i mean how serious, let's put it, how serious should we take them at the end? Or are you just saying they just give us a very small glimpse of... Um, yes, uh, at one point I described them as cr crumbs from the table of the masters, you know. But it depends which treatise. If we talk about Ganassi, Ganassi's Fontegara, 1535, he paints a, a picture of recorded playing that I've never heard anybody even attempt to do nowadays. There must have been incredible virtuosity. He describes imitating nature, imitating speech, you know, putting, uh, putting words, the missing words into the music and so on. And he, 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 he gives you a lot of crumbs. There's a lot of information about articulation and fingerings and so on. So that treatise particularly is one that is well worth studying at great length as I have and others have too. Um, probably we should say Quantz in the 18th century too. He, he gave away a lot of information that, that uh, we can take seriously. But most of the other treatises about woodwind instruments um, don't give so much away. Cromlitz, perhaps? <laughs> Say what? Cromlitz, perhaps? We won't have... Oh, Cromlitz. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very long-winded. Yeah, well, he was, yes, of course, he was trying to outdo Quantz. I was thinking more of the Baroque period. Yes, that's yeah. for sure. He was um, definitely gave more away. Also quite entertaining to read um, in terms of um, his attitude and in, in describing things to just the... In this very uh, sarcastic uh, tone, um, yeah, it's just the, very, the, a bit the, entertaining. The, the I'm better than you are kind of attitude, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, we have a message for, here um, from Leah saying, "I always had the idea that recordings had changed the way of playing when artists started to listen to themselves." That's very true. I think the fact that we grew, we now grow up or we grew up with recordings and also edited recordings, um, that oh. definitely changes our perception of, um, you know, perception of music making. Well, particularly edited recordings have put a lot of pressure on performers, right? Because when you play live performances, audiences expect you to sound like recordings. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's put a lot more stress in the music business, I think. Yes. <laughs> and, and so, and, and it emphasizes accuracy at the expense of uh, musicianship, I would say. I mean, this is not hard and fast rule, but, uh, but, it, but it, it, it places maybe too much value on accuracy. 
Yeah, well, that's a that's certainly a topic for another time. <laughs> for another day, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> um, do you have any new writings in the works, or are there any specific projects that you'd like to mention here for our audience? Well, first of all, I'd like to mention one that came out a couple of years ago, and that's the the book on the recorder published by Yale University Press. My co-editor was Robert Ehrlich, who were a couple of others in authors involved in it. This is a book that I spent 19 years researching and writing. And you might say, why on earth did it take you so long? And then I would say, well, not, not that I'm slow particularly, I, I did get sidetracked with a few other projects. But when I was commissioned to write this book, I felt that there was no serious research, no serious research had been done on many aspects of recorder history. So I did it myself. And so I wrote several books and long articles, um, which I then extracted from to put into my my portions of that book. That's why it took partly took took so long. And um, I'd like to recommend it to people. So it, it's a, a serious study of the history of the recorder, the first since my old teacher Edgar Hunt in 1962. So it came out exactly 60 years after that book was published. And so I'd like to recommend that Yale University Press. And then, um, as you know, I have my own publishing company now called Instant Harmony. I've been publishing books with that. And I have a number of uh, short books and real books, longer books uh, that will be coming out soon. The one that I um, think will be the most important is, is a study of the recorder in Spain and Portugal and their colonies in the 16th and century, 16th and 17th centuries. When the Yale book was almost finished, um, I suddenly learned about, um, I, somebody gave me a few references from Spain. And when I started pursuing them, it opened up into this enormous amount of research. So I, I researched a, a whole book basically on the subject, which I had to cut down to a few sections. But it's very remarkable that the history of the instrument in Spain and Portugal and their colonies is quite different from the history anywhere else in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the, the history in the New World is, is completely unprecedented. And so that's going to be a very fun book when it's finished. Um, I'm still working on that and refining it because there are many other things to do. So I hope that that will be out by the end of this year. Uh, another book that I started and didn't finish because of the Yale book is the development of the Baroque woodwind instruments in the middle of the 17th century. Mm. It's very fashionable now to downplay the role of the Otter family in that and try and say, oh, well, there were or might have been other people who developed these instruments. But my research puts them right in the heart of the territory where the instruments were developed. And this was research that I did for my book on Lully, where I looked at who were the performers for Lully. The main performers who performed in Lully's works were members of the Otter family. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so I'm developing that, <laughs> not just flute and recorder, but also oboe and bassoon a bit and so on. Um, so I'd like to finish that sometime. And then um, I started writing a book with a, a Belgian flutist called Wim Brabant yes. uh, about Buffardin, Pierre Gabriel Buffardin, okay. who was one of the most important flute players in history. He uh, was the teacher of Quantz. He was the first flute player in the orchestra in, in Dresden, Dresden in the first half of the 18th century, which was considered the main, the best orchestra in Europe. And not so long ago was discovered, a flute made by him was discovered and it turned out to be one of the best surviving flutes. And he was clearly a very important flute maker. We know, we know also that he's, he did some inventions. And so, so he was an important performer. He also composed some good pieces from here on. So we've got performer, he was a composer, and he was a maker and inventor and, and teacher. And so there is a book that's mostly finished that will be about his life or his contributions to all of that. 
There are other books too, but I wanted, those, are the, those are the major ones I wanted to remember. Notice to the silence amongst everyone. Well, how do you find time to do anything else, David? <laughs> um, I, I just want to. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm very, very efficient in my time. Usually I wake up early in the morning and work for two or three hours before the family gets up, and that's when I do my research. Oh, yeah, and then you can finish your 10 books. In, in that if you, if you do two or three hours a day, every day, it's amazing how much you can do, actually. <laughs> I just want to plug in right in here. Um, you can have access and purchase the majority of David's publications um, through his website, uh, instantharmony.net. I just put in the chat um, the address, uh, just very simple, instantharmony.net. Um, it's newly set up, and it's also a lot easier to navigate than it used to be. So congratulations, David, on doing those um, updates and improvements. Um, and you'd be able to either uh, download um, articles. Um, I think most, if not all, the articles are for free or make um, PDF purchases. And if you want actual um, PDF so printed copies, um, if you want actual printed copies, um, you can find David on Amazon through your local Amazon site. All right, did that, was that all yeah. correct, David? Um, so I say good, good marketing, good, good plugs there, right? No, no. It's true. <laughs> well, you know, I want to spread useful information and certainly, you know, those articles that are made available for free and also just basically, you know, people have much easier access to them. That's that's a great asset uh, to have. So thank you very much for doing that. May I just add, it's true that the books, most of the books are available in print from Amazon. Um, many of my editions are also available in print from a German company called Edition Valhall. You know Valhall? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. something to do with Valhalla perhaps, I don't know anyway. But um, so, you can obtain printed copies of most of the editions there if you want them. I know some people like to have printed copies, not PDFs, yeah. but so you can have both. I'm one of them, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, we are almost to the hour and we haven't even gone to healing yet. So um, we are just gonna keep going. And if people need to go, um, you can catch the video of this uh, session um, later in your free time. But I do want to go ahead now to get into the healing aspect of um, David. Um, so tell us how you got started with healing. The first experience I had as a healer was when I was about seven. <clears throat> so my mother suddenly became very ill and she was a very strong, healthy person normally. And, and she went to bed and I thought, oh, this is very strange. And so uh, I went to the bathroom and poured her a glass of water and gave her the water and she recovered very quickly. And so I didn't think about that very much until later when I thought, well, she was probably dehydrated because like good English people, we, we drank lots of tea constantly, <laughs> many, many cups of tea every day. But I don't think we drank any water. I think I only drank a little water at school. I don't think we drank water at home, only tea. So she was probably very hydrated and the water hydrated her. And and she was healed. So that was my first experience. But then when I was a teenager, in my mid-teens, I started to become very tired. I had what would now be called chronic fatigue, and nobody could help me because there was very little awareness of, of fatigue at that time. This is in the early 60s, I suppose. Um, and so I had to figure out how to heal myself. And it started, um, actually, Betty Mather was very helpful with that. When I went to Iowa and I told her I was feeling tired all the time, she said, um, I think it's because you're, you're eating a lot of sugar or drinking a lot of sugar. And I said, what do you mean? Everybody eats sugar. And she said, well, you know, it's, you, you look into this. You do a little research. You discover sugar is not so good for you. And so I did. And sure enough, there was plenty of evidence um, against it. I, I won't make any blanket statements, but, but I certainly discovered when I stopped eating sugar, I certainly discovered it made a very big difference to me. And I think that this is true about all uh, advice about diets, because you read all kinds of contrary information about diet and food. And I think you have to figure out what works for you. So what works for me is certainly no sugar. And so I, at that point, I stopped um, consuming sugar 
caffeine, alcohol, milk, and meat. And I haven't consumed any of those for more than 50 years now. And that, that was the start of healing myself. It was through food. And so I thought, well, the food is the answer. If only people would fix their diets, they'll be well, right? Well, no, it wasn't as simple as that. <laughs> and so later on, uh, the next stage was probably in the 90s when my first wife was very sick with asthma. And uh, I used to have to do a lot of body work on her every day to keep her loose so she could keep breathing and stay alive, quite frankly. And at that point, healing energy started pouring out of my hands spontaneously. And so that's when I discovered the world of healing energy. It's like, oh, what is this? Where it's coming from? And I showed it to people and they said, oh, it feels very hot. Oh, but your hands are not hot. What's going on? What is this? And so I wondered too. And so then I started pursuing. So what does it mean to, to heal using energy? That was the beginning of it. So was that, did that just come, came, that came intuitively? I mean, nobody taught you, it did, right? No, spontaneously. I did show it to to a guy who was a Reiki practitioner and he said, oh, that's very good, David, but you need some discipline. Why don't I teach you Reiki? You know? So Reiki is often an entry point for people into energy work as well. And so he taught me Reiki and, and I learned soon something called magnified healing. Um, and they were good and they were helpful up to a point. I started working with flower essences, which are called Bach Blüte in, in German, right? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. And, um, and they were great up to a point. And then everything I did worked up to a point. And then I thought, okay, well, there's more to discover. And so then I started studying energy medicine, which is where you have to learn, really, you have to learn about anatomy and physiology, and you have to really have to understand how the body works physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, energetically, and so on. So I, I went through a number of those systems that were very helpful and each one better than the last. And when I discovered each one, I thought, okay, now we have the answer, but no, <laughs> like, no. So I've always wanted to learn more. I, I, I cannot work with any particular system. All systems are great as far as they go, but there's always more to discover. And then eventually about five years ago, um, something else happened spontaneously. I started being able to do energy transmissions that a friend called vibrational hugs because that's how they felt to her they had this kind of warm embracing quality mm -hmm. and i just create them spontaneously if there was a particular subject so the, the the invention happened one day i was working with a fellow healer we were doing an exchange and this is a very hip person and she i wondered what on earth i could do for her and then she told me that she had been never been really appreciated as a child so i thought okay i can send you some in, some energy for that so there was some being appreciated as a child energy i just created it out of nowhere this will, this will help you too <laughs> so, so that was the beginning of it and then i started developing those and in the end i uh, developed I've developed more than 500 of them because they come up all the time in healing sessions whatever people need I I invent and um, you can infuse them into into works of art so I did some works of art that are infused with them you can infuse them into music so I wrote some compositions that are infused with the energy and um, yeah it's a great thing to play with <laughs> Sounds amazing. Yeah. So that's that's your that's your. So this so, so say, this latest, is my this your, is my big thing. Method, so right. what I do what I do though in healing sessions is it's not that I'm limited to vibrational hugs, but vibrational hugs are an important tool that I have at my disposal, and I also have whatever I learned earlier from from other forms of healing and energy medicine, and so I like to tune into the person I'm working on and whatever they need. So again, it's a spontaneous thing. It comes to you, this is intuitive, whatever they need, I know intuitively, and then I can give them what I feel they need in that moment, which is selected from the old, or it might be something new. Maybe tomorrow I'll invent something else, I don't know. 
I don't know if you remember when I had my first session with you. So this is my personal um, attest here. <laughs> so um, I, yes. before our healing session, I had, um, was at dinner with a couple of uh, former teachers and I was staying actually at your house um, at that point. So after dinner, I came back home and we were supposed to meet uh, for this session. And, um, and I had already felt that something was a bit off from the food that I had eaten, but you know, I didn't say anything. I was like, okay, I'll just you know, get over it. And, um, and I, I didn't tell you about that I wasn't feeling well. And I don't think I showed anything on my face. It was just a little bit of stomach pain, you know? And so, you know, we went into your studio and then you, you know, at that point you kind of, you touched my arm here. That's how you, I don't know if that's how you start now. Mm -hmm. but, um, so you touched my arm and then shortly afterwards, I said, oh, you know, you have food poisoning. <laughs> and I just jumped <laughs> and felt like, okay, I, I believe in anything that you <laughs> because it was just not you know, it was, uh, I could not believe the fact that you could feel that, uh, you know, I had food poisoning. And then, yes, in the next couple of days, my stomach continued to uh, do not so well. And, um, and I'm sure it was from the food because I was already kind of feeling bad um, during the, during the meal. Uh, um, so yeah, that's just, that is so strong in my memory. And um, ah. yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's really an amazing thing. Um, do you find a connection between the work you do in music and in healing? Do you feel they benefit from I don't, each other or any? Oh, they probably do. And people ask me this question expecting that I'm really doing musical music therapy or something like that, which I'm not. Uh, to me, they just have been, both have been spontaneous expressions of my myself, my inner self. The healing started, you see, very young. Interest in music also started fairly young. And um, I, they, they've been passions of mine that I've been pursuing. So it's, it's a dual passion. I highly yeah. recommend that people follow their passion in their life. But for me, those have been the two major passions that I'm still pursuing after, well, more than 70 years. So would you say these two, both music and feeling, that they have equal weight in your identity? Or is one, do you feel one is stronger than the other? I don't, I don't like to make that kind of comparison. <clears throat> on any given day, there, there may be more emphasis on one than the other. Mm. At the moment, um, I'm probably doing more work with music in my life because um, I remarried recently, and my, my new wife is also a music researcher and a recorder player, and so that tends to influence what I'm doing. We're also working on some things together, so I'm very much focusing on music research at the moment, but I'm still doing healing sessions, and the, you know, the healing is still there, so the proportion varies from time to time, day to day, but I, I feel sure they, they will continue. I would be surprised. And, you know, people in the healing business, I mean, about 10 years ago, two healers said to me, you know, you're a really good healer and this music work you're doing is just so academic. Why don't you just stop doing it? What are you doing it for? You have a very limited experience, you know, a very, very limited audience for the music. Just be a healer. But no, because that was about the time when... Um, especially through Facebook and various other things on the internet, I discovered what an audience I had in music. You know, there were thousands of people in Europe that I never met, for example, who knew my name and knew my publications. People started writing to me, wow, I just read this great article of yours. And I looked over something that I wrote 30 years ago, you know. And so I discovered that, that, I, that I actually had a very big public for my music research. And that was very encouraging to me. Because when you sit at home and you just send things out to be published or whatever, you have no idea. Yeah. You have some idea of the sales, but you don't know how they're impacting people through the internet and especially social media. I found out that they impacted people a lot. Oh, yes. And when I came to Brazil, it's like, wow, this is the famous David, you know? It's like, oh, I didn't know I was so famous here. <laughs> I said, well, everybody knows you here as a researcher of the Ricardo. So, okay, well, I had no idea I had a public in Brazil. So there we are. Wonderful, yes. 
And as a final question, you know, as someone who's obviously had clients from all over the world with, and you've dealt with a whole variety of issues, um, you know, healing issues um, with your clients, um, could you offer some words of wisdom to our audience here? Well, I guess the, for the first thing is what the, the Oracle of Delphi said, know thyself. Remember that one? <clears throat> or know yourself in modern English? Know yourself. But it's easier said than done because as we're growing up, we fit into an infrastructure that's created by, by the family, um, school, um, church, if we go to one, society in general, the uh, language, uh, languages we speak and so on, fit us into a kind of framework, which is necessary for us to live. But there are aspects of that that do not serve us. And so we have to release, in order to really free ourselves as people, we have to release what's no longer serving us. Actually, I wrote a book about this called Release Your Shackles. The shackles are the things that are not serving us in our life anymore. So know yourself. And then as you release things that are not serving you in your life, then you get to know you, yourself more. And then you live, live a much freer life. And then also, um, as I said, uh, follow your passion. Or passions could be two or more. <laughs> That's what I would say to everybody. That's what I work with people on in healing sessions. And I, that's, that's my suggestion to you all. Releasing your shackles and following yeah. your passion. Yes, know, know yourself, release the shackles, follow your passion. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. For those oh, you're very welcome. It's been very fun talking to you. Wow. So we come to the end of our session here. I forgot to mention if you had any questions, um, um, feel free to pop in, uh, in, in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand or un unmute yourself. Um, I just have a message here from Anastasia. Thank you for sharing your experience, David. For me, it is a good example. And in the area of music and in healing, how somebody could listen so clear and so obvious his own body to all sensations of the body, to his own intuition. And somebody who trusts so much his own intuition. Thank you for the inspiration. Yes, oh, it's not, easy to, it's not mm. easy to trust our own intuition. That's very true. But, it, but this was, a, she's right, this was a very important stage at the beginning of healing. I did uh, begin to trust my intuition. In the beginning, uh, it was more like after the fact. I had an, in, um, an intuitive um, glimpse of something and didn't follow it. And afterwards, I thought, oh, why didn't I follow that? You know, and after you've done enough of why didn't I do that, then you begin to do it. And then you begin to trust yourself. Yeah, but it is important. Would you say also humor along the way is good something? Good oh, yes, humor is very healing. <laughs> Absolutely. I find myself sometimes I take things a bit too seriously, and then that also kind of destroys my trust in myself. Well, yeah. <laughs> so you need some. You need some. Uh, what's the? No, I won't. I won't go on about it. No. <laughs> so, I ask another question. <laughs> okay. Anybody have any other questions or any comments? Questions? I just have a. I just have a question. Um, as, as a medic myself, um, what happened to your chemistry training? Is that, uh, has that filtered through or is that very much not, not one of your passions anymore? Um, I, I won't say that I threw it away completely, but certainly I never pursued it further, except that uh, I, I noticed that people in general are a little frightened by chemicals, by chemical names, for example, and so on. And all I can say is they don't frighten me. That's something something I got out of it. And you can't pull the wool over my eyes either, you know, when you start talking about chemical things and going, hmm, I'm not, not sure you know what you're talking about. That, that's usually how it works. <laughs> Makes sense, yeah, I wanted say I, I enjoyed your reading your most recent version of your biography and 
this was what got me into to first oh okay yes in about oh, well, 1990 so <laughs> well good well that's what got me started you know that's the, the book that got me accepted into graduate school in music and so on yeah yeah yeah, great. And th I'm, th I'm thinking about doing a revised version of that translation. I forgot to mention that as well. There, there are many projects, so I don't know when that will come out, but uh, that represented my very first attempts at music research before I ever studied anything. And, and you do get a different perspective after you study. <laughs> but I'm glad it still, was still helpful to you. Definitely was, and I look forward to the revised version. I'll lap it up when it comes out. Oh, great. Okay. Very <laughs> good. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. We have a question from Leah. Leah? Yes. Hi, baby. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, you, I think we know a little bit each other, uh, David, but, um, you know, I born in Mexico and I did uh, my thesis of the bachelor in in by this uh, Mexican composer Manuel de Sumaya, who was the Kapellmeister of the cathedral in Mexico City. Uh -huh. um, during that research, I had this very um, uh, discovery of a Spanish uh, musicologist who wrote a doctoral thesis, Javier Marin Lopez, I think that's his name. And it was the first time I came across to the mention that there were recorders in Mexico, in the cathedral of Mexico City. Although yes. I, in all this time, I have never found or heard anybody who has, let's say, a an, an very antique instrument before, you know, 1850, uh, which I think we have few pianos and few uh, instruments. We yeah. Playing, but not really recorders, and, um, which is interesting because in this uh, doctoral thesis, there was a lot written about, there were plenty of recorders back then. Um, and it was just an open question uh, to you. What is uh, your uh, experience or your ideas on this uh, situation or why it's not mentioned or lost maybe? Since you're in- Well, person, you know? <clears throat> well, you know, the first thing is I, I'm sure you know very well that, that musicology uh, grew up in Germany primarily and then spread to Anglo countries um, and they considered Spain and Portugal and the New World to be on the fringe of music, right? They didn't take music from those countries very seriously. And so it's only been really fairly recently that that extensive research has been done by musicologists in Spain and Portugal and Mexico and so on, on their own music, that we, we've discovered the extent of it. That's uh, so the first thing I want to say. And then, um, what amazed me when I started looking at music in Spain and Portugal and their colonies in the 16th century was how much information has survived. So we have an incredible amount of documentation. The biggest documentation is actually in Brazil, where I am now, because the Jesuits who came over in 1550 brought recorders with them. They used recorders uh, as an element of converting the indigenous people to Christianity. And the indigenous people were very musical and responded very well. I know this is a controversial subject, but I'm just saying this is the fact, <laughs> this is the fact. And so the Jesuits reported in very great detail on, the, on their contact with recorders and with the local people. And so this book uh, that I'm writing at the moment will have 30 pages just about Brazil. As far as I know, no instruments survive and very little music survives because when the Jesuits were forced to leave the country in 1750, the, the authorities destroyed all of their documents. The documents that we have are the ones that the Jesuits sent back to, to Portugal and that they've survived in archives in Portugal. In, in Spanish speaking countries though, there are, you know, you have documents in archives in Mexico and other Spanish speaking countries that, that document um, 16th, 17th, 18th century, yeah, quite extensive use of, of wind instruments. Maybe not quite as much focus on the recorder as in Brazil, but, but certainly plenty of evidence and, and flutes of course as well. And um, so we'll see, there's certainly a lot to write about now. And I'm so happy that researchers like yourself are working on these subjects because 
Everybody needs to know this. This is, this is very important. From the point of view of the history of the recorder, what the, happened in Spain and Portugal in the 16th century was they made extensive use of the recorder in sacred music, much more so than anywhere else. We have a little evidence from Italy and a little bit from England and France, but by and large, uh, we don't know much about the use of the recorder in sacred music in the 16th century, but we have this very extensive evidence now from Spain and Portugal and the New World, and it's revolutionary to me. It completely changed my you know, whole opinion of recorder history, knowing how it was used in those countries. So there will be more, and now there will be a whole book on this subject, which I'm also hoping will be published in, in Spanish and Portuguese as well as in English, so that people can read about their own history. That's very nice, thank you. You're very welcome. Great, any other questions? Well, seems like everybody is happy and satisfied. All right, good. <laughs> what were you able to provide, David? So I was expecting somebody might be coming with a treatise and asking you, or an article and asking you what, <laughs> what you mean by this. What? What did you mean by this? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you so much, David. Oh, Mary, did you have your hand up? <laughs> you need to unmute yourself? <laughs> yes. I do have a question for you. How do you go about researching when the research, there is no research? So, for example, you were talking about, um, I can't remember what topic it was, but there had been no research done. So you are the one who then comes up with the material. How do you go about yes. doing that? Oh, it's an interesting question. Well, it, it, it depends what the subject is, but you, you have to get you have to get your foot in the door somewhere, right? You get started somewhere. Mm. For example, um, my research usually begins with a question. So for example, the book that I wrote about Lully, Jean-Baptiste Lully, what I wanted to know was a simple question. When Lully wrote the word flute in his manuscripts, did he mean the flute or the recorder? And no one has, uh, had ever answered that question seriously. And so one of the, well, of course I, I, I obtained as many manuscripts and nowadays it's very easy uh, because of Gallica, of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, it's very easy to get um, the, the, there are very few autographed manuscripts, they are mostly copied by Philidor, but you can get copies of the manuscripts and, and you can study them, you can look at keys and ranges and so on. So I did that very extensively. But then I wanted to know, well, who performed this music, you see, back to this question. And then I discovered that the livret told me the answer. The livre were the printed librettos that were produced for performances. So when you went to the opera in Paris or Versailles in those days, you could buy a printed copy of the libretto. And it, not only did it have the words and so on, but it often had the names of the performers and even what they played. So I studied all the surviving livrets, there were about 50 of them, something like that. And I looked, oh, here's a member of the Autotera family playing the recorder. Well, what do you know? You know? And so I studied all of that. And then I made, then I looked into the biographies of the players and blah, blah, blah. And so that's how I got started. So from the manuscripts of the music and from the livret, I wrote a whole book. That's absolutely I mean, amazing. I mean, so that's how it starts. So, so we have to have, so I couldn't have done that without modern technology. You know, the, fa the fact that the livret and manuscripts were available, I could download them free online, even free. <laughs> you know, in the, in the old days when I started, if you wanted music, you had to buy microfilms from libraries. That's you know, and it cost money and then, you know, you had to buy them and then you had to look at them and it was, it was very tedious, but, but most of my editions from those were done from microfilm. But it's incredible now what's available through modern technology.
that makes this kind of thing possible. Another thing that I found very useful when I was working on uh, England and the United States was newspaper databases. There are now databases that have got the text, searchable texts of English and U United States and colonial American newspapers from the 18th and 19th centuries. And um, they're not terribly easy to search, but if you know a bit about searching, as I did from being a librarian, you can get a lot out of it. And, be, and through that, I was able to do extensive research that I had no chance ever of doing in the past. For example, uh, most of the English newspapers are kept in um, a branch of the British Library in the north of London. And if I had wanted to study them, I would have had to get some money and go and and stay in London for a year, camp out, go to the British Library every day, or order copies, you know, six a day or whatever their limit was, you know, look through them. No, there was, there was no practical way of doing that. But because nowadays we have this access to these databases, it's incredible. And so I was able to do things. And this is most of what I discovered while working on the Yale book was, wow, look what we have now. We have newspaper databases. We have these livre. Look at all these manuscripts. Look what we have now on IMSLP. So many things are available now. Mm -hmm. And so that's the raw material for the research. It depends on what your question is. But there's so much raw material available to sink your teeth into now. And that's what I've done for every one of my projects. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I also remember those days. Another um, uh, remembrance from my study uh, semester with you that you had given me copies, or I photocopied your copies of yes. uh, some air de cour, which you had gathered, I think, from your research, from doing the airs and brunettes. Um, um, collection, and so you had given me cop your copies of um, oh, wow. from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France with, um, you know, airs from Jean Autotère, you know, with the, the composers that yeah, that we would otherwise have um, no access to. But nowadays, through uh, IMSLP and also they're much more America, available. Yes, and I no, remember but, those but copies it, were my prized possessions. A, lo a lot <laughs> of people asked me years. for a lot of people asked me for copies of those in those days. So that was a nice story, actually, because um, I was working on this edition of Otto der Air Equinet, and so I wrote to uh, Catherine Massip, who I think was by then the head of the bibliothek the music section of the Bibliothèque Nationale, and I just asked her casually. Do you happen to have any copies of any of these um, songs? And she said, you know, we actually, we have our own database. We have an in-house database of all of these songs and we do have them and we can send you copies of all of the ones that, that he wrote Double for. And I go, oh my God, you know? And so out, out of her kindness and their research in, as a library, I was able to obtain copies of the songs and make that edition. So thanks to the kindness of librarians, yeah. <laughs> of one librarian, yeah. So that's how that happened, but that was how you had to do it. You had to obtain photocopies or microfilm in those days. Nowadays, you go to IMSLP or you just go to the, Bibliothe the Gallica Bibliothèque Nationale website and you can download PDFs. Yes. So research has certainly changed and it's very exciting. It's really opened up a lot that we couldn't do in the old days so easily. Also, the search method has simplified. I mean, you know, on Gallica, it's very easy. Um, you, you know, you just key in, put in some keywords, and then it 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 it's a great search uh, uh, engine that it, it gives you a you know immediately what you're looking for, more or less. I mean, I've always had great success with it. Just saying. Well, that I it's, think you know, it's a well, lot, well, on, online cataloging is something. You know, online catalogs. And databases came in during my time. They they came in probably in the nineties, and um, the invention of keyword searching revolutionized everything. It meant that the cataloging had to be very detailed. So you know, it always had been very detailed. But when we had cards, cards in card catalogs and so oh, yes. on, <laughs> they were very difficult to use. But keyword searching certainly has revolutionized um, everything. Some of the revolutions are word processing, databases, all of those things. 
social media, they've revolutionized research. So would you say digitalization has brought only good things to research? Uh. <laughs> I wonder about, I mean, it's, you know, on Friday, <laughs> just as a side note, we should, we should be closing soon, but I just want to say, yes. you know, on, on Friday, I was at the um, Leica Museum, Museum, so Leica, the manufacturer. The camera, the, the camera, yes, yes. yes. And, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a company with a lot of uh, rich tradition and history in um, optics and, and camera making. And we have this conversation all the time, you know, in the camera um, industry, well, yeah, analog or digitalization, and there are, um, of course, the majority of people are in the digital camp, let's say, but there is also now even a comeback of people who um, are dedicating themselves to analog photography. They go, they've gone back to analog, right? Um, printing, um, printing photos, yeah. You know, obviously, research is maybe a different thing, but I'm just wondering. I think, it's a, I think the analogy is with recording, you know, analog versus digital recordings where people were very excited about digital recordings in the beginning, but then some skepticism came in and, you know, and people are even buying LPs, you know, there's a big, big market in LPs now, people have gone back to analog, because there was something in the sound quality that they missed in digital. I think that's the parallel. For research, I think the only drawback I would say to digitization is thinking that that the searches that you've done in the in the media that you know uh, will provide everything that you need because not everything is digitized yet mm -hmm. and not every search is perfect you know and so on and so you can kid yourself you can delude yourself into thinking that you found everything when more exists and so i think that's the only thing it could be a drawback mm -hmm. I did a Google some... search on this. I know everything, but well, wait a minute. <laughs> what kind of search did you do? What search engine, et cetera, et cetera, you know? What are you some examples? Bit... Yeah, hmm? sorry. What are some examples that are not, would you say that are not, um, not available on the internet yet? Yeah. Well, if you look at IMSLP, so I, I, I had heard people tell me, Oh, we don't need editions anymore because facsimiles of everything are available on IMSLP. And I thought, wow, is that true? So I checked it out. So what happened was that I obtained the copyright to all of the editions I had published with Nova Music in the around about 1980. And I thought, well, let me check. Um, are these available on IMSLP, um, either editions or originals or not and I found I found five that that were not present on IMSLP so I thought okay I can um, I can reprint them safely so not everything is there most things may be there but not everything that's just one example that I made some good use of <laughs> after people have reassured me who needs editions anymore well editions have their place I should also say that when more than one source exists for something too, the uh, editors do have their place because you have to weigh up the sources and um, you know evaluate them and come to some kind of solutions about what what kind of text to present to the public. So there's definitely a role for editions and editors. I know early music people are crazy about facsimiles, but I say, well, just be just be cautious, okay. <laughs> If it's just one source with no mistakes in, right. and you understand the notation, okay. But otherwise, yeah, be a little cautious. <laughs> okay. Well, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you also to our audience um, for spending time together. Um, and um, yeah, this has for me been really a wonderful session to um, get people together and to, um, to talk to you more in depth and be able to share with everyone. Um, 
so obviously this session is recorded so you can watch the replay if you would like or share this uh, uh, with other people um it'll be uploaded onto my youtube channel just um, search under teddy huang um teddy talks traverso continues in two weeks time um, where i'll be again giving a free talk on um, some of my favorite flutes that's going to be on June 8th on a Saturday morning uh, here in Germany. And then on the next day on Sunday, I'll be giving uh, my workshop called The Art in Articulation. And you can find all related uh, information on the Teddy Talk to Traverso um, Eventbrite site. And um, feel free to subscribe to my newsletter um, to get the latest updates, as well as getting tips here and there about um, historical flute playing. Thank you all once again. And with that, we end our session today and hope to see you all the next mm, time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take bye care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.